I want to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors, uh, Kristen Kelly, who was a, a student uh, at Indiana University, but now she is off to her own career. Uh, she is at Vetsebe uh, at Berlin uh, Social Science Center. And Elizabeth Hirsch is also my uh, co-author. She's at uh, uh, University of British Columbia in Canada. All right, so and then also I, no, I want to acknowledge the funding agency. It is funded by the, uh, the NSF, National Science Foundation in the US. So, all right, so I talked just a little bit about uh, this, but uh, you know, these long work hours and what we, what I call as overwork uh, problems. It has been reported in many ways, uh, particularly, uh, you know, when you think about those people who work long hours, we tend to have a, we tend to value those people. So we tend to think about the way that we think about um, these good workers. Uh, in the workplace is that those people who um, are able to and who can put in all their energy and time for work, paid work, and as if they don't have any other things going on in their life, like no personal responsibilities and no family responsibilities. So what scholars uh, talk about as a, this uh, ideal worker norm, uh, or sometimes you know, work devotion schema, uh, uh, sociologist Blair Loy uh, talk about as a work devotion schema, and I tend to use the a little bit more like a long hours angle, so overwork norm. And those all sort of like, you know, have this tendency that we value those people and that we think that they are, are more productive workers. And then as a result, we reward them as, as much. And um, so that tends to um, have a negative outcomes, you know, first of all, for the obvious level, like there's a health consequences. So um, it has been shown that, you know, those people who are putting in long hours and then they uh, are burn out and they um, it, 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 they suffer with this uh, negative like well-being uh, measures and as well as health measures. And also, as I um, talked a little bit uh, already, there is an implication for gender inequality. So then how can we address um, this problem? So scholars have already sort of like explored these ideas, uh, whether the changes to these, um, you know, work hours, long work hours and overwork um, uh, possible and uh, whether the flexible work policies can be an answer. So uh, people tend to focus on this organization policy, especially in the US context, because we don't have a strong national uh, policies, but the, so people just focus on the, what the organization, what the, you know, uh, employers can do to fix these problems. Uh, so one of the things that uh, scholars have paid attention is the flexible work policies. You know, we can, we are now very familiar with because of the pandemic. So now we work at home and then now we like work, you know, flexible hours. Uh, so that, uh, and those are the things that uh, scholars pay attention to. The reason is that, you know, uh, the way that we think about work and then the way that we structure our time and work is very rigid. And it is a focus on this core nine to five hours. And then also it is, um, you know, at the location of the work site, employers, um, you know, we, we go to the work and then we do FaceTime, you know, even though work is all done when nobody's leaving and then they just uh, be there. And, uh, and also we just tend to value those people who can be there all the time whenever the employers, um, you know, ask them to be available. So it is a, there's on-call expectations for that too. So, um, Scholars just, uh, you know, the talk about we need to rethink about uh, how we structure our work and uh, re redesign the work that we uh, the way that we used to do. So um, it is uh, then I think, you know, they actually they suggest this as a solutions to address this health and then uh, gender inequality problems, but uh, they also uh, talk about the way that we think about the work, the shift in those uh, can be, a, um, you know, fundamentally, uh, we can challenge the way that we think of, think about the good workers, you know, we can challenge the ideal worker norm from its core. So that was the idea that there's a lot of intervention studies on uh, some of uh, you might be familiar with. Uh, there has been a workplace initiatives, uh, and then they study those interventions, sort of like a natural experiment, like before the initiatives uh, started and after that, how these things um, changes. And they, there's a strong, um, you know, findings that uh, these sort of like, you know, the no normalized flexible work policies are actually very effective uh, to improve workers' well-being. Um, so th there's all these studies out there, but at the same time, um, when we look at the national level, uh, the more um, broader level uh, studies, 
it, it, the finding has been a little bit mixed, you know, whether the flexible work policies can actually do something to, uh, to improve, you know, workers' well-being uh, or the gender inequality. So it has been a little bit mixed uh, besides those uh, more, um, I guess, methodologically more rigor rigorous uh, this intervention studies. So it could be to something that is related to methodological issues, but at the same time, if you look really closely about you know, how they um, uh, implement these uh, flexible work policies in those intervention studies is actually very different from uh, how things are done in the rest of the world. So, um, you know, when we talk about flexible work policies, we just tend to think about just one thing, but the way that it is implemented, there's a wide levels of variations. So um, the way that it's done in the intervention studies, it comes with a strong, um, you know, support from the top, you know, organization leaders are on board and then they, you know, provide a support to implement those policies. So there's a kind of strong signal that, you know, it's okay to take this policy. And also uh, there's a, you know, clear guidelines. And another thing uh, that, uh, you know, these intervention studies, um, the flexible work policies in these intervention studies, uh, the way it is done is it's not so much focused on specific groups. You know, a lot of the organizations, they, they call it an accommodation model. So those people who need these policies can ask for it and then they can give that to you. So it is all available, but it, uh, you know, goes through these negotiation processes. Whereas uh, the way it is done in the intervention studies, it is just given to everybody. So you don't even need to ask for it. So it is just there to, for you to take it. So it is uh, implemented across the board instead of selecting and focusing in just one group of workers, which is typically women with the children. So um, those can be uh, very different. So the, in, the in, taking those insight from the intervention studies, so perhaps it is not so much about, you know, whether the uh, flexible policies, it, uh, the presence of it can change all these outcomes. It is how it is implemented, under what conditions these uh, policies can be implemented can make a big differences. So um, the focus of this study, the goal of my study, uh, is to assess uh, just focusing on these organizational conditions and how these policies are implemented and under what conditions and how does that um, change the way that we think about the ideal worker norm and in turn change the employee uh, outcome as well. So that is the goal of this study. So what kind of conditions that am I, uh, am I looking uh, for here? So there are four um, sort of like a, a different kind of overarching principles that I'm considering here. The first one is a gender neutrality. You know, as I said, you know, a lot of the uh, organizational uh, uh, policies in other, you know, beside, beyond these uh, uh, intervention studies, they tend to really focus on women with children, you know, women's need. It's a sort of like a frame that's a, you know, woman's problem. So it's a really emphasized like a feminine, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, that aspect of it. Uh, so uh, then I think that, you know, because the way that we devalue femininity in our society, uh, we expect that emphasizing those of femininity and then like you know women's needs uh, can introduce stigma uh, is enhance the stigma of using these policies so um, the key to success to these uh, these uh, these studies uh, these are policies uh, is uh, the, how the organization can frame these policies in a little bit more gender neutral way instead of emphasizing you know the uh, family needs uh, or women's needs uh, they can emphasize um, you know, these policies are implemented to improve the well-being of the workers or enhance the productivity or talent acquisition. So those kind of more gender neutral term uh, can be um, increase the efficacy of the of the policies. And then um, so the second um, uh, principle is a transparency. You know, the oftentimes if people don't take advantage of these policies because they don't know too much about the policies, then they have to ask for it around and it's a whole these navigation, you know, uh, processes can actually enhance the flexibility stigma, which is like, you know, stigma attached to uh, using these policies. They're, they uh, are considered as a less loyal uh, to the organizations. They are considered a less productive, uh, less committed to their career. So all these, uh, um, you know, stigma can be really highlighted in those processes. So when the um, policies are um, implemented in a, with a really 
really clear guidelines. Everybody knows and how to access those policies, and that is a clearly written. Uh, it is a there's a lot of organizational support to sort of like disseminate that information. Then I think then we expect that that is associated with the you know address. Um, you know, there's an overwork problem in the in the workplace as well. And then uh, another thing is a consistency and then uh, the role of the managerial discretion. You know, a lot of the um, research, especially Caleb and Kelly uh, talk extensively about this. Uh, the way that uh, the, the flexible work policies are implemented in a lot of the organizations uh, in the U.S. is that um, it has to go through the, you know, uh, negotiation uh, with the managers. So policies are there. So it is a they call it a formalized discretion. So it is a it is on the book, and everybody can take advantage of it. But uh, you have to, still have to ask for it, and it is a completely up to the managers uh, who can decide whether they can give that policy to you or not. So it is a you have a right to ask for it. But the, whether you can uh, actually use it or not, it's a completely up to the manager's discretion. So, you know, in, in some cases, manager can um, give the policy to, uh, policy to one group of employees, uh, but not the other, with no clear reason. So it is completely up to the uh, managers. So we uh, consider this a consistency uh, uh, in policy granting processes. If the managers, um, you know, tend to offer the, those policies a little bit more consistent way, you know, if the workers, you know, actually perceive that, you know, these are given, uh, you know, across the, uh, um, depending on some of the principles and rather than just uh, randomly uh, distributed, you know, there's a in clarity about who is going to get the policy. Uh, so those are important to just, um, address the workplace culture problem. So that's another thing that uh, we consider like a formalized policies are uh, better uh, than, you know, completely up to the man managerial discretion. Uh, the third policy, which is a little bit like overlapping with the transparency in some ways, um, you know, how easy it is to use this policy. It's an easy access. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, when people can easily, you know, access uh, to these policies and uh, that's going to make the uh, implementation a little bit more clear and then they can take advantage of it and uh, as a result it, it is more likely to just generate the outcome that is in, in, intended uh, to do. And then we also consider a prevalence of policy use, you know, how many people are using these policies, um, you know, depending on those that can be normalized, you know, they're using these policies. So we consider this and then how long this policy has been implemented. And then, then it has been around for a long time, then that can that can be, you know, something that people know about this more. And then they, people think that it's uh, some of, uh, you know, within their reach. So it is more likely to be accessed easily uh, by the employees. And then another uh, uh, one is a supervisor support. Uh, it has been, especially this is also very clear in the US context, you know, a lot of the times, you know, it is up to the manager's uh, discretion. So it is really important to gain, uh, garner the supervisor support to use these policies. If you don't have, a, uh, you know, really uh, unsupportive supervisors and none of these policies are gonna, you know, work. So supervisor support has been consistently shown by prior research that it is the key to um, to generate the uh, improved well-being outcomes for for workers, and so we also um, take a look at this uh, effect of the supervisor support uh, in the context of whether these policies can actually change the way that we think about the ideal workers. So address this problem. Uh, so uh, we use we collected our uh, own data. Uh, so we uh, conduct the original survey about uh, approximately about four thousand people. Um, fielded uh, by NORC at the University of Chicago. So it is pre-pandemic data. We, um, you know, fielded this survey between March 2019 and June uh, 2019 over the three three months uh, period. And then we use their Amerispeak panel. Uh, this is a probability-based panel. These days there are so many, um, you know, platforms that you can conduct your own survey, but uh, there's not not that many probability-based uh, panels. So this is a, one of those few. And so it is designed to be representative of the U.S. household population. And our target population among those is uh, non-self-employed U.S. adults aged uh, 18 and older, and uh, they are employed as a paid employees. Uh, and then we also focus on the mid to large size organizations uh, that uh, is more likely to, you know, um, 
practice this kind of you know, flexible work policies in a more, little bit more formal way instead of, you know, in the small organizations, it's, um, it's completely done in an informal way. So we just focus on the mid to uh, uh, larger size of the employers. Uh, it is a, you know, a, this kind of like a panel survey, it is a kind of tricky to kind of calculate the response rate, but uh, and some of the metrics that the rated recruitment rate is uh, how the panels are recruited in the first place. Uh, it is about 32.1%. And then survey completion rate among those uh, panels are uh, 95%. So, yeah, you know, the recruiting panel, you know, uh, and then constructing this uh, probability based panel was a, was a little bit of a challenge, but once that uh, those panels are recruited, they have a high uh, completion rate. And then it was done uh, with a web and phone, so it is a dual mode, but vast majority of them just completed with a uh, web based survey. And an analytic example is uh, we lose some of the cases, so it is ended up uh, 3,500 approximately, depending on the uh, dependent variable that we are using. So um, in, in any of the cases, uh, in none of the cases, the missing rate in the one particular variable is very high. It's a um, quite a high quality data, but just all together, when you just uh, you know uh, creating a data set, it becomes about 10% uh, missing rate. Uh, so we um, take a look at the, you know, by uh, multiply imputing the data and it looks, you know, virtually identical. So we are just, uh, you know, presenting the, um, the result from the completed case analysis here. All right, so the dependent variable that we are uh, interested in, you know, how these organization policies are, um, it, whether they have an ability to change the ideal worker norm. So we, um, look at the ideal worker norm measure. Um, so we asked the respondents to rate uh, how important it is in the following, um, you know, the uh, traits and characteristics uh, to define successful employees in your organizations. So we had about uh, about 10 uh, of those statements uh, such as like working long hours and you know, overtime hours and, and et cetera. So, and when you uh, conduct a factor analysis, it seems like there are two underlying, uh, you know, uh, factors uh, underneath. So we just kind of, you know, divide it up uh, onto two. So first one is what we call the, uh, as a ideal worker norm, as a day-to-day -day availability. So it is a more uh, focusing on the whether, you know, they are available to work uh, on a day-to-day. -day. So working long hours, work overtime hours when uh, whenever needed, frequently bring work home, available beyond working hours, and work whenever employer uh, needs them to do so. So those are the same and they kind of lines up, uh, lined up with the, um, this, this factor. <clears throat> and then so we create a summative scale based upon those. So that's what we call the day-to-day -day availability. And then the second one is what we call the broad, uh, broader availability. So it is also kind of like an availability, but it's more like a coarse grain. So uh, in a big chunk of time, putting work first and often do not take a vacation, uh, don't take a you know, sick leave and a family leave. So it is uh, you know, being available, but for the longer period of time, instead of just taking completely taking time off for the longer period of time. So those are the two, uh, two uh, factors that we saw. So we create a separate variable uh, based upon those. And there's another one that we collected uh, to capture the flexibility stigma a little bit more direct way. So you know, the extent to which the respondents agreed to this statement, uh, which is uh, using these policies is a career limiting move. So this is just a four point scale um, uh, the, the measure so everything is a four point scale because we just create a summative uh, uh, scale. So that's a, a first set of the dependent variables and they their distributions will look a little bit like this. Uh, so you, as you can see, some of the things that I want to emphasize is that how uh, prevalent and persistent of this ideal worker norm, especially the first one, you can see that the mean um, is over three. So it is a four point scale. So it is a uh, you know, how how well this describes the, you know, uh, workers, successful employees in your work, work organization, not too well, um, uh, not too, uh, uh, never, and then not too well, and uh, somewhat well, and uh, very well. So it is that uh, everything is over three, it's, uh, the mean is over three, and it is pretty skewed here to the, um, 
you know, the higher values. So that means that uh, pretty much a lot of people just agree to that uh, statement that, and you know, the ideal workers in our organization work long hours, they are available all the time. So that uh, seems to be the pattern that we see here. And then for the second one, we see a little bit more uh, variations. So um, the mean is uh, below three. So it is, uh, I think it was about 2.8 in, in this case. So people tend to you know, have a little bit more varying uh, levels of opinions about whether it is important to just not take any kind of family leave or sick leave uh, or uh, vacations and, and things like that. So it's, there's also the reason why we kind of differentiated these two types of ideal worker norm is there's a class um, implications. The first one is more emphasized in a professional and managerial, um, managerial context. And the second one is a little bit more emphasized in uh, non-professional uh, and non-managerial occupations. So that tends to be uh, the pattern. The first one is just a four point scale. So you can, it's a, um, you can see that uh, there's a uh, perceived flexibility stigma. Uh, there's a, a lot of people I don't know whether it actually accurately uh, reflected, probably it is, but the people just think that uh, uh, there's not so much about the uh, stigma, um, but the fair, number, fair amount of people, I think it all together, uh, about like 25% uh, of them uh, agrees that there is a, some, some extent of the um, stigma that is attached to the using the flexibility. Okay. All right, so that was a first set of the dependent variable, and the second set of the dependent variables uh, are the you know measuring the employee outcomes. So we uh, use um, some of the novel measure that we created. Uh, one is the self-assessed fit to the ideal worker image, because we are interested in you know how these conditions can actually you know impact the way that uh, the workplace culture. So we just wanted to create a like you know that tie into that. So how much of these organization conditions matter in terms of the way that employees um, evaluate themselves, you know, self-assess that they are closer to this, uh, you know, ideal worker uh, image. So it is, uh, we use this uh, wording, think of the image that most of your coworkers hold of a, uh, a highly successful employee in your organization. How closely do you think you fit to this image? So that you know, extent to which they agree to that is uh, um, is the, this this measure, and then also we use the self-assessed uh, fit to the organization uh, and the job. And this measure has been used by some other prior work, uh, such as Aaron Sech and uh, Wien and Corell's uh, research. So it is also sort of like a tapping into this a cultural component about you know cultural fit argument, like how much of the, these can matter that employees actually think about themselves. It is a good fit for the organizations, a good fit for the um, for the job. And also we have some traditional measures that have been uh, used uh, by other studies as well, like a turnover intention, job satisfaction, uh, work family conflicts, and happiness and uh, depression scale. So the key independent variable, I am not gonna go uh, too much in detail because I already conceptually explained all, all those, you know, it's a pretty um, closely tie into those, uh, but the, there are two set of the variables, the way that we um, measure that is, because there are people who say uh, they don't have access to this, these policies, we create this, uh, you know, indicator variable, set of dummy variables, no policies, and then um, there's only, you know, time off, you know, leave is only available. And then uh, the uh, third one is on top of that um, uh, flexible policy, you know, the telecommuting or flexible uh, work time uh, is available. So it is, uh, um, you know, for the people who say yes to the third one, uh, it's possible that they also have a leave. Um, they are, uh, they have access to leave but also they uh, have access to flexible policies or the, they don't, don't access to leave, but only flexible uh, work policies they can take advantage of. But in that, the latter case is pretty rare. In a lot of the cases, people have at least, you know, access to paid leave because, you know, we are focusing on the uh, larger organizations. They tend to have at least, you know, unpaid leave, which is uh, mandated by the national level law. So, um, so that's, uh, you know, the three is more on, on top of this, uh, two, and then uh, they have something more, uh, which is a flexible work policies. And then we measure the, these are conditions, um, these um, to measure all these, you know, organizational conditions. Okay. 
right. So I can explain more if anyone wants to know about the, how each of the measures are um, constructed. But the, uh, uh, the first one that I want to show is the uh, estimated ideal worker norm scores by availability of flexible work policies. So as you can see, you know, the sheer abs uh, the presence or absence of these policies actually don't matter too much to differentiate the ideal worker norm. You know, there are two types of ideal worker norm here that I show. You can see that the... Um, then there's a no policy, which is you know not that many cases here, um, but the across all these you know you don't see a lot of differences, so it doesn't matter. Um, it, they are all overlapping and uh, in terms of 95 uh, percent confidence interval, so it is not statistically di uh, you know different from each other either. So it's just the uh, you know, main effect uh, only uh, doesn't actually show any kind of differences. So what actually matters is, is that there's a, a lot of variations uh, even um, among these um, you know, organizations uh, that do have these, uh, some of these policies. Uh, so that is the whole point of this, uh, this work that it's actually not the presence of the policies, actually the conditions actually matters more. So this is the, the model that uh, shows that um, uh, with this, uh, Zoom, I cannot show, <laughs> see my own screen, so I have to just move things around a little bit. All right, so now I can see it. So it's a, um, this is a, the OLS regression model that has a different outcome. So it has, it shows like a three different outcomes. Um, so he, the, in the prior slide, and I didn't show the flexibility uh, stigma because uh, it, it is only asked for those people, oops. Only people uh, who ha said who have access to these policies, so it is a little bit, it is not comparable uh, in terms of the sample and, and those. But uh, here I show everything here. Um, so um, you can see that uh, uh, overall, so um, the patterns are consistent with what we expected, with a few exceptions. So let's um, talk about the feminized policy first. Like at first, a gender neutrality. You can see that the feminized policy, uh, meaning that uh, it is measured by, you know, um, people perceive this is a mainly used by uh, women. Um, so that's that's the, uh, the how this variable is measured. And you can see that there's a um, positive across all, all three measures of the ideal worker norms that uh, meaning that, you know, having um, policies that are feminized uh, is associated with a, a stronger ideal worker norm. So they tend to define ideal workers as a someone that is, we think it is a traditional notion of this ideal worker norm, who is working long hours and working all the time, bringing work home and then not taking sick leave. And, you know, they also uh, tend to uh, perceive that there's a strong uh, uh, flexibility stigma in those organizations. But uh, what is really puzzling is this one. Uh, so <laughs> this is something that we did not anticipate. So we expected initially that the gender neutral framing is associated with the, you know, weakening uh, the ideal worker norm. But this is precisely the opposite of what we expected. So it, is, it has a positive coefficient. Um, you know, but the perceived flexibility stigma, there's a still a negative. So meaning that, you know, in the, uh, organizations that frame the uh, these flexible work policies as a some more gender neutral term, and then um, they provide a support in a more neutral way. They tend to um, have a see uh, the perceive that there's a you know less flexibility stigma. Um, so it is a little bit puzzling about what's going on here in the with the gender neutral framing, but it's at least consistent across the board, which is also uh, shown here. Supervisor support uh, is also positively correlated with the ideal worker norm, uh, meaning that you know when supervisors provide a lot of support, and then they uh, also perceive the ideal worker norm is stronger in those organizations. It's not not the case in the perceived flexibility stigma. So, um, but the later will show that actually this is uh, um, and when we see the employee outcome, these workers also um, tend to show the better. Um, this is a gender neutral framing and supervisor support is a strong predictor of a better well being outcome. So, what seems to suggest is that, you know, in these organizations that, um, you know, gender neutral way uh, of a support 
for. This is more like a support measure. And then they are supporting the workers and they uh, tend to endorse the idea worker norm strongly, but also they feel good about themselves and they work longer hours. So that, that, seems, uh, that seems to be the pattern, which I think it is uh, something to do with the, uh, the nature of this data set. It's a cross-sectional, uh, not a longitudinal. So it is a, there's a sort of those kind of uh, heterogeneity uh, among the uh, organizations. So we can uh, talk a little bit more about those uh, later when we look at the employee outcome. But that tends to be, that is the uh, sort of like exception, but other things are by and large, uh, especially inconsistency of the policy granting is a really strong Strong predictor of um, uh, the, you know, increasing the the, the, the tendency of uh, employees therein uh, to find ideal workers in a more traditional way, and then uh, also the easy access is uh, negatively associated with the stronger ideal worker norms. It is all um, what we have uh, predicted. So just uh, showing the little bit of a, uh, it's hard to um, kind of gauge the what is the magnitude of this. I just wanted to show a little bit of a plot here. Uh, so you can see the gender neutral framing, there's a, a positive uh, correlation and then the, but the, with the flexibility stigma, it is a negative correlation. Um, so it is, but what I wanna, the, the one of the reasons that I wanted to show this plot is to see this, uh, how little um, of the variance that exists in the, this uh, first ideal worker norm measure. You know, uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, remarkable that it, it is a positive but small significant effect. So it is you know kind of showing that how resilient this uh, ideal worker norm is across uh, organization. It's a uh, pretty universal in some ways, and there's a little variations, but not as much as other measures. So the first uh, set of the ideal worker norm measures are very consistent and, and persistent, you know, across all these organizations and organization conditions. And feminization, you can see that some of the, these factors, again, uh, it is um, feminization associated, positively associated with the stronger ideal worker norm, but the more so in the second and the third uh, measure. And then again, uh, the effect is pretty modest for the first ideal worker norm measure. In the first place, there's not that much variance to uh, start with. The inconsistency, again, uh, you can uh, see that there's a more variations, especially flexibility stigma, uh, and the second measure about the very little variations uh, in here, but it's all significant effect. Uh, the effect size varies across all these different ideal worker norm. Um, this is the, the accessibility and how easy it is to use these policies. It is an important indicator. Um, the first ideal worker norm measure, it didn't have a significant effect. Uh, but the, the second and the third one, you can see it is neg negatively uh, correlated with the, uh, uh, the access, accessibility and then these uh, ideal worker norm measures. Supervisor support, again, there's a, this, uh, a puzzling finding here, uh, but the second and third measure, there is a negative associations uh, with the, the ideal worker norm. So that was a first um, first set of uh, outcomes, and now we are moving to uh, the second set of uh, outcome measures, which is the employee outcomes. You know, the first one is a self-assessed fit, uh, and then a job fit and organization of fit and turnover intention, and it, it keeps going. Uh, job satisfaction, work family conflict, happiness, and uh, this is a depression scale short, short form. So we use this. And then it is a pretty consistent now that gender neutral framing as a positive, um, you know, it is, you know, those, those employee, employees who are in the organizations with a gender neutral framing uh, of these uh, policies, they tend to <clears throat> evaluate themselves as a um, closer to this a successful employee image in those organizations. And then they think that uh, they are good fit for those organizations and job and they're uh, less likely to um, leave the job within 12 months. Um, and then their job satisfaction level is higher and then they are happier. So it is, uh, you know, it's uh, but it's what we expected. Um, and the feminized policies, you can see that it has a negative, um, not so much here, but the work family conflict is, uh, um, it's positively uh, associated with the, uh, you know, feminized policy. So in some ways, like, you know, they tend to, targeting these policies for women who need these the most, you know, to address the work family conflict, but is actually have uh, the opposite of the effect 
that they uh, intended to do so. So that's, uh, that's uh, unfortunate. And then uh, the transparency matters as well. Um, you know, the, it has a positive outcomes across uh, different um, measures here and higher job satisfaction and <clears throat> clear guidelines, you know, those self assessment speed and the job fit uh, is a, has a positive impact on those. Um, and then I think that inconsistent policy granting matters only for the work family conflicts here. Oh, also the depression scale. So it has uh, all these um, the different, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, across all these different measures and we see pretty consistent uh, patterns here. Um, accessibility, easy access are always measure. Oh, there's a one thing that is a little bit puzzling um, here is a prevalence measure. We initially anticipated that, you know, in the um, organizations that a lot of people use these policies, uh, it normalizes. So it reduces the, uh, the flexibility stigma and then generate the more, you know, positive well-being outcome. But this is actually the opposite of what we anticipated. You know, turnover intention is uh, higher in those organizations and work family conflict is uh, more intense and then um, they are more likely to be depressed. So this is a, something that is a little bit puzzling. I think that is something to do with uh, what we enter into this because when we just um, um, look at it, you know, only with this prevalence measure, it is the opposite way. So it could, it could be something to do with, uh, you know, what we are netting, netting it out. Um, it's a maybe highly correlated with other measures. Although the, the multicollinearity doesn't seem to be a, a problem here, but it is something to do with the other control variables that uh, we are entering into this model. So supervisor support uh, also uh, pretty similar to uh, the similar story that we saw about the gender neutral framing. Uh, earlier we saw that it had a, the opposite uh, effect, but the, here it's all what we uh, anticipated. So higher levels of the supervisor support uh, is associated with a better uh, employee well-being uh, and the career outcome. So that's all I have any conclusions um, quickly. I think that the talk intend to do a little bit uh, longer, uh, the shorter, but the, it, it became a little bit longer, you know, uh, if, um, but the ideal worker norm, what, what it suggests is that, you know, if these organizations provide a lot of support for the ideal worker, uh, the workers can meet this ideal worker norm and then uh, they feel pretty good about themselves, uh, but, um, but they, it doesn't seem like they're, uh, their well-being is, uh, you know, uh, compromised as much as in other organizations. That seems like the pattern that we saw here. Another really um, consistent finding uh, is that how, you know, persistent this ideal worker is, especially the first one that is more prevalent in the uh, professional and, and the manager occupations. Uh, that tends to be uh, the pattern that we see very, very little, um, you know, variations in those measures, uh, even across the, all these organizations. Uh, but the small effect that we found uh, here, given that the ideal worker norm is really resilient and persistent, uh, the small, uh, you know, changes that we see uh, should be taken uh, seriously because, you know, the, how can we really like uh, tackle this uh, really strong norm in the workplace? Uh, always start from the small. So we think that, that this is a sort of like a key to um, kind of cracking this uh, rigid norm in the workplace. And also, um, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, even though the, it may uh, be a little bit more um, challenging to tackle the ideal work or norm all the way through, but uh, it, it, these uh, organizational conditions also have a very important impact on the employee uh, outcomes. They tend to have a more larger uh, effect size as well. So these um, conditions matter greatly, especially supportive organizational conditions uh, tend to increase the well-being and then career, uh, like a job fit and then self-assessed fit and then intention, turnover intention, all those uh, matters in, in this kind of context. Thank you.